Let us do a few exercises. In the first one, uh, this one is we've already done before, but I wanted to try to do it again. Uh, given the following grammar, where you have two productions, it starts with A, and then it produces 0, A, 1, or it produces B, and then from B it produces 1, B, or epsilon. So first thing you should be asking yourself is what is the language that this grammar recognizes? If you think a bit about it, you will see that the language recognized by this grammar is a language that reads A's, and the same number of A's as B's with this, this rule, right? But then at any point we can replace it by B. What is B doing? It's reading, it's basically one star, right? It can read zero more ones. So essentially, if we combine these two rules, what we're saying is that we will read more ones than zeros, right? Because from this one, we read as many as zeros as ones. But with this rule, we can read uh, more ones, right? So how do we write this rule? Please revise your uh, slides where we learn about how to convert a grammar into a PDA. So I'm going to ask you to pause this video, try to solve it yourself, and after that I'm going to show you the, the solution. Okay, so the solution is very simple. As we recall, we first push the dollar sign, the sentinel, just so we know when we've ended uh, our stack. And then we push the initial variable, which in this case is A. And then we're going to have one, two, three, four rules, each one, two, three, and four. And then we're going to have um, one self loop for each terminal, which in this case is zero and one. So we have zero to zero, one to one. And then we have this, um, this rule, A to B. So we pop A and push B this rule we push we pop b and push epsilon then we see this rule 1b it's going to be the small one we read backwards so 1b because the edge is going this way so we read it this way and we pop b so that's correct and finally pop a and push 0a1 so let's look at the rule backwards 0a1 and we pop a so that's all fine. Finally, we have this edge from Q3 to Q4 that pops P and it terminates. Next question is, can we prove that L union with L2 is not context-free? So if we have this, can we conclude that L1 is not context-free or L2 is not context-free? Right? And the basic idea to get this right is just remember the contrapositive, right? What the contrapositive is saying, if you recall, in the we've learned how to combine two grammars, and we also learn with union, and we also learn how to combine two PDAs with union, right? We create an initial state, and we go with an epsilon transition to each of the two combined the, uh, PDAs. We actually did that at the end of the lesson where we learned about PDAs. So we know that any language that context-free language, if we combine it with a union operator, we still get a PDA, therefore a context-free language. So what we actually know is the reverse of this. What we know is if L1 is context-free and L2 is context-free, then the union of them is also context-free. So knowing that, what we can do is we can, we have this fact one, we can apply the contrapositive and that tells us that we have that L1 not L1 implies the negation of this whole thing and then if you simplify you will get that L1 is not context free or L2 is not context free and actually if you try to do that on cock using the cock proof assistant you will have a hard trouble because uh, you don't you cannot simplify negation of union with not A or not B so we'll see that. We'll try that later um, in, in, in a later exercise. And we'll talk a bit about why that's not possible. Although it is possible in classical logic, why can't we prove this using the proof assistant? So another exercise that I want you to think about is 
we've learned how to prove that a language is not context-free um, by using the pumping lemma, right? That was the subject of the last lesson. But we are still able to prove that some languages are not context-free without using the pumping lemma directly. Why? Because, for instance, in this exercise, we know that L2 is not context-free, right? And now we need to show that this language is not context-free, right? But what we've learned before is that, in the previous example, if L1 union with L2 is not context-free, then either L1 is not context-free and L2 is not context-free. So if we use this result, we can actually conclude that L3 is not, not context-free. Why? Because either, either if this is not context-free, then either there, L2 can be separated into two languages, right? The first one is this one. The second one is this one. But the second one we know, the length of W being even, is actually a regular expression. So it's a regular language. So if it's a regular language and the whole thing is not context-free, then it must be true that W is not context-free. And the proof is very simple. Okay. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to talk a bit about Turing machines uh, and what is the configuration and configuration history.